Welcome um, and thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, you're one of the 300 people attending the called third webinar in our series on artificial intelligence and the future of regulation. Um, the first webinar of this series, we focus on artificial intelligence and data governance uh, in the COVID-19 context. The second was on a business and human rights approach to artificial intelligence. Uh, today, uh, in this webinar, instead, we will discuss uh, uh, more broadly artificial intelligence and the future of regulation. Um, Lord Clement Jones, who, among many other titles and roles, has led the House of Lords work on artificial intelligence and is the chairman of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Artificial Intelligence. We lead a conversation with experts, with the leading experts in this field. Uh, we have today, it's, a, it's an honor to, um, to have them today join us, um, Professor Christopher Hodge, um, Professor at the Oxford University Faculty of Law, uh, Paul Nemitz, uh, who is the Principal Advisor on Justice Policy at the European Commission, uh, Jacob Turner, a barrister at Fontaine Court Chambers, uh, and the author of the book uh, Robot Rules, and Claudia Pagliari from Edinburgh University. Um, just uh, a reminder, I know that by now you must be even too familiar with Zoom webinars, but uh, um, just so that you know the people in the audience are not visible or audible, but we are taking questions from the audience. So please type your question in the Q&A box. You can also interact with questions that others are asking and uh, upvote them. Um, I now handing over to Lockham and Jones, who um, will lead the conversation for the next hour and a half. The webinar is due to end at 1.30 p.m. Uh, and the video recording of it will be available on the Beacon website shortly after the, the event. Over to you, Tim. Irene, thank you very much indeed. And thank you um, to the BIICL as well uh, for facilitating what I know is going to be a fascinating conversation uh, today. Now, many of us have been preaching the gospel of ethical AI for some years, but however well-intentioned ethical principles and good corporate governance guidelines may not be enough. I advocate strong corporate governance and accountability and that boards should have the skill sets to ensure that ethics are embedded in corporate behavior and adopt a governance structure which recognizes that the fruits of new technology need to be shared more widely. But there may well come a point where the risks attendant on non-compliance with ethical principles is so high that policymakers need to understand when certain forms of AI development and adoption require regulation. Now, uh, there's a clear hierarchy which can be followed depending on the risk involved. Where the risk is lower, a flexible approach, such as an ethical code without a hard mechanism, can be envisaged. Where the risk is high, a firm compliance mechanism needs to be built in via regulation. So we have ethical codes, the OECD, the EU, G20 and others, uh, and those adopted by business, including the AI partnership. Then we have corporate governance using business guidelines issued by organizations such as the Institute of Business Ethics and Investment Managers, along with compliance tools such as audit, kite marking, impact assessments. Then we come to government best practice further up the hierarchy, such as the government AI procurement guidelines. Finally, we have full blown regulation, such as the GDPR, that being adopted for autonomous vehicles, and that proposed for deployment of live facial recognition technology. But how do we evaluate the impact of various AI technologies? How do we calibrate the risk which will determine what level we need to go to? Do we have the necessary tools for risk assessment and a clear understanding of the necessary escalation in compliance mechanisms to match? Do we know when the precautionary principle should be invoked? As is commonly accepted and has been extremely well illustrated during COVID, the language of risk is fraught with misunderstanding. How do we achieve any kind of consensus on what the hierarchy of risk associated with AI systems is? Do we have a, stake, a set of stakeholders in mind when we have tried to achieve that consensus? No, can we posit a number of useful questions? What harms from AI are we trying to prevent? The level of risk to society of those harms occurring uh, are, are what? Depending on the decision being made or the product or service being delivered? 
What is our ability to ensure compliance with or without regulation? What constitutes effective regulation? How differently should we treat the same application in different sectors? Is there a trade-off for public good, for example? What will be the impact on innovation? Of course, we should also ask ourselves careful questions about what legal liability under regulation there should be and what rights of redress. Finally, in the digital world, we have to ask ourselves, can a single country regulate effectively? Can we limit the power of big tech in the first place? Now, this is where much of the focus of policymakers has shifted. We saw it in the German Data Ethics Commission with its five point scale of risk, and then the EU white paper, which kick started a discussion of risk based sector specific regulation. We've seen it very recently in the AI Barometer, published just a few days ago by the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, which also discusses risk and regulation and found a common core of risk factors across sectors. The Alan Turing Institute is involved too in work into whether it's possible to establish a set of principles that establish when regulation is appropriate. And of course, we now have a newly formed Regulatory Horizons Council too. So AI regulation is very topical, but fraught with difficult questions. Luckily, Help is on hand for our, from our expert panel, which in different ways has been immersed in the issues surrounding technology regulation. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome them here today. Now I'm gonna start and hand over to you, Christopher. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today and to talk to everyone. I'm. Um, Chris Hodges and I'm Professor of Justice Systems based at the Centre for Socio-Legal Studies in Oxford. Um, I spend my time looking at regulatory systems across different countries and different sectors and we'll try and share with you some overviews on um, and looking at regulation um, from some distance so as to get some broad principles and ideas. I also spend time looking at dispute resolution systems, um, going from courts, arbitration, ombudsmen, small business commissioners, et cetera, et cetera. And those are relevant. And certainly you, Lord Clement James, have um, referred to the aspects of, of how they fit in. But most of what I'm going to talk about is regulation. Now, this has inevitably to be rather brief because of our, our brief of uh, being asked to talk initially for five minutes. Um, I should say also that the ideas here come from a group of international experts um, of which I'm on the, um, on the board called the International Network for Delivery of Regulation, INDR. And we are looking at ideas on regulation literally across the world, USA, Canada, Brazil, Australia, Finland, etc. Um, with a few um, pilot studies on what I'm going to talk about. There seem to me to be two major problems at the moment, or two changes. One is the geographical problem that um, AI and data systems generally are global. So traditional discussions about regulation, which have all existed within um, Westphalian style individual states, simply don't work. Um, the traditional model, secondly, is also changing. But the traditional model is very legal. Um, and it assumes that you have rather a linear approach with someone makes the rules, you identify a breach, the authorities enforce, and then you assume that you get general compliance. And that assumption, that leap of faith is based on theories of deterrence, which come out of legal philosophy and economic classical theory, but are under very significant attack from behavioral psychology and other um, ap approaches, empirical approaches but it is linear. And that linear model of deterrence doesn't work where you've got um, global players who are not subject to jurisdictions. So we don't have a global government. We don't have a global regulator. And therefore, we have to think about something else. Now, that seems to me to force us back into um, talking in very basic terms about what is regulation. So here are a few thoughts on that. The essence of regulation, it seems to me, is um, 
in, in many ways to support sensible and useful um, services and products rather than the criminal end, which is more the police end of taking people out. Of course, that is relevant. But actually, for regulation, you've effectively got a genuine business that you're saying, please do it this way. And that leads into the second point, which is not just support, but actual policing, but, but saying um, we want to protect people from unintentional harms or any harms, but largely unintentional harms, perhaps. How do we do that? So one has a conflict of approaches between protection and facilitation, perhaps, or policing. Um, but it is also true that what we had thought about as enforcement needs to produce a third element, which is that people can see fairness. So if someone does something bad, there are consequences. And in the global context, that is really difficult because here we are sitting in, let's say, the UK, the UK or Europe, and someone absolutely anywhere around the world could be doing something bad. That isn't fair. And that is the basic psychological motivation within which we, we will only want to engage if we can see consequences. So at the one end of this, uh, the policing scale, um, people need to be taken out if they are consciously harming us with criminal intent. But at the other end of the scale, we actually want to see a level playing field within which everyone is doing the right thing. How do we do that? How do we integrate these approaches of public benefit and public protection? Um, at the moment, some of these ideas are going through a very profound transformation. And a lot of it is led by um, or underpinned perhaps by behavioral psychology um, about saying what is enforcement, what is deterrence? Why do people get things wrong? Why do people observe rules? Why do people break rules? And that takes us into um, a huge amount of science for which we don't have time, but one starts off with um, easy, acceptable, uh, sorry, um, um, books which one, one can read rather rather easily, like Kahneman's um, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is really transformative. But there are many other books, um, and I would particularly recommend a book called Blueprint by, um, um, I've forgotten his name, sorry, <laughs> embarrassing. Anyway, it's a very good book, um, published last year, um, looking at the, the genetic approaches in people um, Chris Tarkis, that's his name, um, it, and as to why people do things and why people do wrong things. And that explains a lot of why people in large companies could do the wrong thing when they're intending to do the right thing. A lot of this comes down also to the, the objectives of maximizing um, shareholder value as opposed to stakeholder value and corporate governance elements already referred to. So I think we have to transform a lot of those. They are being transformed. I think we can do more. The ethical and cultural approach um, is definitely changing. And there are some regulators and some sectors who have found that they have to change the way they do things. Um, high safety situations do this. So civil aviation, and nuclear, for example, uh, after Three Mile Island in nuclear, but, but actually the civil aviation uh, industry worldwide realized from the 1980s that they had to have a different approach and they call it a cultural approach. So they talk about an open culture and a just culture. The open culture means everyone shares every piece of information all the time in a no blame context. And the worst thing you can do is not share the information. As soon as you get found out, no one will trust you, you're out. And that applies to individuals and organizations, basically. Um, you have to build trust. So one looks at what builds trust. Now, philosophers all say, for example, um, Baroness O'Neill, um, written wonderfully on this, trust is based on evidence. So one therefore produces evidence that you can be trusted. What is your culture? Some of this may be uh, technical in terms of historical regulation with quality systems and approaches and governance systems and all the rest of it, but you're reinterpreting the information in a different way. Can I be trusted is the point. The just culture element is equally important 
and that means that there are consequences. If things go wrong, people look at what the root cause was in civil aviation and then sort it out. So they use the learning all the time and um, change things, basically. Do you need more training? Do you need better systems? Do you need more AI? Do you need to change what you're doing? Have you got the wrong people in the wrong job? Have you got a criminal? that you should remove from this situation. So people can see that they have confidence in this and that builds up the no blame context. Now, one can see immediately that a no blame culture is utterly different from our general approach of trying to deter everyone. The point here is you will use hard enforcement on serious criminals, but you don't use that tool on most of the other people because it will actually reduce compliance rather than increase it. So the differentiation on motivation between different people is very important. One then looks for structures that do this and are completely, I, I, loads of examples frankly now exist. There are some from safety in construction sites. Um, uh, there, are, there are others in the area of the relationship between national companies on the high street retailers and their local authorities that's called the primary authority scheme and is basically extremely successful, but it's a structure within which authorities and companies talk to each other and solve problems. And it's little known, but has been amazingly successful. So one differentiates oneself saying, I'm a business or an organization, could be a school, for example, that actually tries to do the right thing all the time. Mistakes may happen, but how you deal with them is evidence of whether you can be trusted or not. So therefore, uh, compensation, redress arrangements, repairing the environment, etc. There are certainly arguments within which, for example, black box thinking would say mistakes should be encouraged, but at least they, we know they're going to happen. But the question is, you don't learn unless mistakes happen to some extent. So let's plan for when the mistakes happen and we can put things right and identify them and learn from them, but support people in the process. So therefore, quick information saying that this is a problem or is this a problem with a feedback system like going, say, to an ombudsman. Um, it is, is an essential part, not just of the dispute resolution and redress system, but it's an essential part of the regulatory system. Now, within this, one needs to know what the rules are. There are a lot of statements of ethical principles, and I agree with the statement made by the UK Committee on Standards in Public Life that there are now too many. They're confusing. Um, we need to pull them together into a, co a coherent approach, and but actually go beneath the statements to say, what are the details? What should we do in particular circumstances? So I, I finish with um, some ideas about what are the basic functions of regulation. And I just list them like this. Think about this in a global context within which we have no global regulator. Who is it who makes the rules in a simple, coherent, consistent, global way. What is the body that's the equivalent of a global parliament that can do that? Because it has to be global. It's no use being trading blocks, EU, China, whatever. It has to be global. Who is involved in making the rules? Everyone should be represented. How do they do that? I have answers to these questions, but I'll just pose them as questions for the moment. So, what are the regulatory objectives? Who sets those? Who makes up the rules? Who, who actually agrees the principles below the rules? Sorry, the rules below the principles um, in order to be specific about what people should do in particular circumstances. Who then says, what evidence should I produce? Who shows commitment to behaving ethically and how do they do it? And how is it verified? Has it verified from outside for everyone? Um, one looks traditionally at systems like compliance systems and audits and inspections or notified bodies or all sorts of approaches like that. What's the equivalent here? And it could be quite a number of different techniques or structures, but what is it? Because those are the functions we need to sort out. Commitment, verification. Then monitoring about um, gonna, what I'm is gonna, going wrong. I'm going to ask you to to, to finish very shortly, Chris. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What is going wrong and why? Then investigation, collating, identifying the problems, sorting it out, 
and responding. Ending up with everyone can see that there are responses, they're fair, and you can learn and move on. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Chris. There are quite a lot of questions that you've thrown back at us there, but I just want to go back to um, what looks like a little bit of a conflict in what you have to say, because you talked about the fact that AI and data and so on are very global, um, and then you went on to talk about the, the trust issue, um, which in a way is a way of avoiding hard regulation uh, to a degree, um, but it surely doesn't the trust issue depend on individual local cultures to some degree. I mean, let me just take one example, robots, for instance. There's a much higher degree of acceptance of robotics in Japan, for instance, than there is in the uh, uh, equivalent uh, uh, European country uh, in many ways. So there's a, different, there's a different view to some degree by culture as to whether or not a particular technology might be a threat worth regulating and so on and so forth. How do you get through the culture barriers when you're trying to use that trust aspect as in a sense the basis for whether you regulate or not? How can you do that on an international basis? Well, it seems to me that, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. There are differences in culture. For example, the approach to women, the approach to, um, uh, euthanasia and so on and they evolve so one can't avoid that um, however uh, the behavioral psychologists say that all of us have unless we're psychopaths a, uh, a gene which knows the difference between right and wrong so therefore that underpins culture that tells us who can I trust because these people are doing right in my terms and those are doing wrong so on that basis, I think that is global and that we can build on that point. So I can see a global structure. One of the answers to some of my problems is I think a matrix works, but it's not just loads of countries coming out with different bits of unintegrated legislation. It has to be a globally integrated matrix. And then the companies have to integrate into that rather than doing their own thing or not becoming part of it. So, I can see different cultural approaches in different geographical areas that could fit perfectly happily within that broad approach. Great, thank you. Well, Paul, you've been wrestling with many of these issues uh, yourself, so over to you. Thank you very much uh, for the possibility to have a discussion today, and thank you uh, in particular for, to the previous speaker for setting out, let's say, a systematic framework it gives me the opportunity to comment on a number of very important remarks. I think this type of systematizing the tools uh, which we have available uh, in light of these global technologies, uh, all-purpose technologies, um, mainly um, but not exclusively um, um, put uh, into function by platform economy, uh, is, is very, very useful, I think, for, for practitioners. And I certainly already very much enjoyed the presentation. Now, let me say, first of all, um, on the question of it has to be global or, or we in the EU do our I have an experience in global regulation and shipping for example and I can tell you that if you say everything every regulation has to be global it is the golden recipe of under regulation of any industry in fact in shipping we have today a tradition where most of the rules go through the IMO, it takes around 10 years to get a consensus in the IMO on rules, and then it takes another 10 years to get them implemented by the member states, and the system really doesn't work. Still today, in the harbors of the West, whether in Hamburg or Harwich, you find slaves inside the bodies, deep bodies of the ship in our harbors in Western Europe, no problem to, to see Indians or Pakistanis whose passport has been taken away, who don't get food, and, and so on. So I think to say that it must be global, I, you know, it is the Kantian dream uh, um, of uh, a, a global society. Of course, we're all friends of the UN, of, of the G20, of the OECD. But to get from policy papers on which we can agree in the G7 and 20, um, 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 to binding rules which really make a difference in the world in the behavior of big uh, corporations. And we're now talking, when we talk AI, we're talking about the biggest corporations uh, in the world, 
all of them are 10 times as big as the biggest EU corporations um, no, notated at the stock exchange. Um, I do not think that we can confine our democracies because that's what it comes down to. We, are, we cannot tell our democracies don't do anything unless there is a global consensus. What, because what does this mean? This means that we cannot anymore regulate the behavior of the actions of these global players in our markets, whether it's about taxation, of course we need our own taxation rules, whether it's about the rules how um, the press can survive in our countries, whether these companies can just take any content which is produced by our newspapers or TV stations for free and make money with it, and also which risks they are allowed to bring into our jurisdiction. So I must say, as much as I have sympathy with a global approach, and I think we have to always be open to discuss and try to find consensus, we must also recognize that our democracies here have, are faced with an expectation of people that democracy makes a difference, and making a difference means adopting democratically legitimized rules. So I do actually see a certain resurgence of the law we had a long phase on AI, um, discussing ethics. I think we also had a long phase of neoliberal discourse, which, you know, law anyway was a bad thing. It was an obstacle to innovation. I think those times are over because many people in many walks of life have understood that even for their own business model, it doesn't work this way. Why? If you don't have law, you cannot secure a level playing field for the good boys in the market. So if we want to have a level playing field for those who have good intentions and who want to be players in the public interest and um, do things right and not bring too many risks to individuals who want to be innovative and so on, I think we must give them certainty that if they stick to the rules, the government makes sure that those who don't want to stick to the rules are held to the rules. So already from the point of view from the internal market of the EU, but beyond that also from the global markets perspective, I think to base everything on individual psychology and good intentions and ethics and only global rules will not work. And um, in this context of the resurgence of the law, I think we have to look at facts. And there are two facts um, I think are important here first the unregulated global internet, the enthusiasm of the one unbroken internet has actually held back a lot of uh, regulation, largely software and the internet were for a long time unregulated, and it has led to a lot of problems, even problems for the good functioning of democracy. So I think we have to learn from this experience, we cannot let go technologies which are developed for profits, which are of global nature, which have huge impacts for CRB, just go like that and say, oh, we'll see later. That is too risky. And the second element of experience, I think we all have to keep in mind that after all, the EU, in contrast to the US, has adopted a number of laws in the space of the digital and the internet, not only GDPR, but also net neutrality, for example, and grosso model, these rules work quite well. And our experience is, and there I would like to come back to uh, what we just heard uh, from uh, the professor, um, the issue of jurisdiction. There is a generally recognized principle in global and in international law, it's actually an old principle of American law, which is called the effects doctrine. So you have jurisdiction when effects effect your people or your territory. And this effects doctrine is, is at the basis of the jurisdictional rules of GDPR, which makes companies subject of our ju jurisdiction if they either offer goods or services in the EU or monitor pe the behavior of people in the EU, even if they have their seat outside. So we can legally on international law make rules which make big players like all the big American and Chinese uh, um, uh, companies, the, all the platforms, all those who provide AI services into the EU market, we can make them subject of our jurisdiction. And I can also tell you this works. 
You know, um, in the making of the GDPR, I had once a fantastic uh, dialogue with a representative of one uh, of the big five, uh, one of the GAFAM, and it went like this. If you introduce fines in GDPR of such a draconic nature, you're, we're, we're talking about 4% of uh, world turnover, there will be no constructive uh, dialogue anymore with the regulator. We will just not talk to you anymore. That's what we were told. And I must say, I also have a background in EU competition law, and I was happy to just respond and say, well, you know, it seems to me the DG and the European Commission you talk most to is DG competition, which can impose up to 10% of world turnover as a fine. So I think, you know, this whole uh, talking about nice motivation and individual psychology and so on, I'm not so sure about this. My experience is rather, you know, these companies, they fight against the rules as long as they can. Once the rules are in place, they nicely fall in line. The competition fines have always been paid. Of course, maybe after litigation before courts, but in the end, we get our fines and these fines have an impact on the behavior of these companies. So I actually, in contrast to the professor, I do believe, of course, in individual psychology, but even more than that, I believe what one needs is clear, democratically legitimized rules, which are enforceable and with very high fines. And these fines have the effects they need to have. In fact, the United States is exactly the, diff, uh, the same way. The Facebook has received a fine of 5 billion uh, US dollars and uh, um, for privacy breaches. And, you know, Facebook is not becoming a perfect company, but this has an impact on, not only on their discourse, but also on the operations. And I would say, you know, I trust the American instinct of dealing with capitalism and its, uh, let's say, uh, you know, negative sides when it comes to fining and, by the way, also when it comes to putting people in prison. I mean, let's be clear about this. EU law is never going after the individual. That may be a weakness of our law. When you do a cartel in America, you go to prison. When you go, do a cartel in Europe, the company is fined a monetary fine. So I would be happy to continue the discussion with the professor about whether the American way of making individuals, holding them responsible and putting them to prison, if they intentionally do something illegal in business, this way of business regulation is actually more or less effective than our European way where we don't do this. So to sum up, I think the European Commission is working towards law for the reason I outlined, namely that AI is too important to be left just to, uh, um, uh, let's say, ethics or individual nice psychology. All this plays a role. I think we must enable, of course, we must enable good practices. We must identify them. We must talk positively about them. But we must also think about the good old way of having democratic laws and institutions which enforce them. Now, here I would like to um, maybe end and say this. The debate about the risk model and the commission has outlined in its uh, uh, white paper on which we had a large consultation. And now, by the way, many of uh, the papers which companies and others have written on in the consultation are publicly available and we could have such a session much more concretely in the future on the basis of these publicly available input uh, papers. We will also make a summary report, but some of the input papers are very uh, interesting. The commission has outlined um, um, a methodology for risk, which is based on a sectoral identification plus the type of practice. So basically with the idea that in certain sectors, the risk to public interest is higher and it is even more high if uh, there are certain practices in this sector. That is one approach. There is, a, let's say, a little bit broader approach uh, in the um, white paper um, of the German um, Ethics um, Commission, which is more based on simply the question which fundamental rights are touched on, which uh, individual uh, rights are touched on, and by how many people. So it's more of a quantitative approach and qualitative approach, but not sector specific. And I foresee that the question of how much sector specific elements and how many general elements we will have in this regulation will be at the core of the debate, like it was in GDPR. 
the American approach is always to plead for sectoral rules. And this has two reasons. First, obviously, some specific problems in sectors can be more easily identified. But second, and this is, let's say, an add-on to the neoliberal approach, which leads to America being very underregulated uh, in these areas, if you only have sectoral rules, it means that large parts of general practice are unregulated. And this is what these companies are aiming for, because in the platform economy, it is foreseeable. They will go into all sectors. That's the nature. We are dealing with an all-purpose technology. AI will be used in all sectors. And the platform economy is, again, a doctrine which says you start in one sector, you use information and the dominant position which you have gained there, and you get get into the other. And you can see it. You know, Facebook wants to start a currency now. Google becomes the biggest um, collector of health data and so on. So in such a situation to say we only want to do sectoral and not have general rules, I think is very, very dangerous. We had the same discussion in GDPR. I am a strong friend of laying down the five, six or seven ground rules on AI, which must be obeyed everywhere. Okay. For example, Paul, no, I'm, I'm going to. I, I know. think we need to. We need to stop just about there, unless you've got one more sentence that you want to. All right. Great. Thanks very much, um, Paul. Just tell me. I mean, we've talked about um, the difficulty, and Chris pushed back on that uh, of, if you like, uh, a common form of uh, of regulation across countries. But even within the EU, you're going to find there's a different approach, aren't you, to risk uh, within different countries. I mean, there are cultural differences that are not yet fully ironed out, if you like, right across Europe. I mean, not necessarily that they'll take a more sectoral approach of the, the kind you're talking about. For instance, though, um, functioning of democracy and so on and so forth, those kinds of of different types of risk. How confident are you that at the end, and there've been some very interesting responses to the white paper, of course, from the insurance industry and so on. How confident are you that actually at the end of the day, you will be able to find a common set of risk uh, assessment principles, if you like? I'm uh, very confident this is not an exercise which is more difficult than GDPR, it's easier. Right, that's very upbeat, if I may say. Right, um, Jacob, well, you're going to have the uh, enviable task, uh, as, uh, uh, and you probably already do, of interpreting regulation and advising on it. Um, uh, so over to you. Good afternoon, and many thanks to the British Institute for the invitation to speak on this panel, as well as to all of our audience for joining us. I'm a barrister, as was mentioned earlier, and writer on AI. Part of my practice involves advising governments, regulators, and private corporations on AI regulation. Over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to speak about the emerging picture for businesses. I think it's helpful to group AI regulation into three areas. First, existing regulation, which impacts on AI but which was not designed with AI in mind. Second, new regulation, which is designed specifically for AI. And third, self-imposed constraints from the companies themselves. As regards all three of these groups, I think 2020 is the year that AI regulation matured. From around 2017 onwards, as we've heard already from the other speakers, we saw various codes of high-level principles being adopted by all manner of organisations, private and public sector. The problem is that they were extremely general in tone and high-level in nature, so of little actual use to businesses except perhaps for public relations purposes. So how, how have things changed? First, existing regulation. The main piece of regulation which impacts the AI as, things, AI as things stands is the GDPR. I'm not talking here about privacy, but rather the provisions of the GDPR which deal with automated decision making. These are largely Articles 13 to 15, which create, amongst other things, a right to meaningful information on the logic involved in any sufficiently important automated decision which is taken using personal data. 
And this is commonly known as the right to an explanation. Examples of this would include a decision made about whether to hire someone or to give them a loan, which is made by an AI system. In that situation, the data subject has the right to ask for an explanation of how the decision was reached. The major issue with this requirement is that many AI systems which use forms of machine learning can be extremely difficult to explain in a manner which involves if-then traditional logic. The right to an explanation presents a real problem for businesses which are using AI in many ways and often very effectively, but may not be able to provide an explanation, not least because it's not entirely clear on the face of it what the GDPR means. 2020 is the year that regulation grew up because regulators have now started to grapple with what the right to an explanation actually means. The Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO in the UK, and the Alan Turing Institute recently published some excellent guidance on explainability, which is exactly what businesses need to be able to balance adherence with the GDPR with providing a good level of services and using AI technology to its full potential. Second, 2020 is an important year because it's the first in which new regulation tailored specifically to AI has been proposed. And we heard a bit about this already from Paul. The EU Commission, the, the European Commission's white paper is a good example. It has some very bold ideas, which by and large businesses have cautiously welcomed, although the suggestion of ex ante authorization of certain high risk technologies has been controversial. The bottom line though, for when I advise businesses, is that until there is greater clarity as to what specific AI regulation is going to look like, then there's no need to take steps as yet. The third development of 2020 is that companies, especially the higher profile ones, have started to take matters into their own hands by imposing constraints on themselves, which go beyond what is required at present by the law. Recent examples of this include Microsoft and IBM issuing announcements this month that they're going to ban their facial recognition technology from being used by police. Less drastically, one of the trends which we're starting to see is the use of internal AI ethics committees within businesses tasked with establishing and implementing ex existing regulation and best practices. I think this latter approach is a very positive one and it's something which I tend to advise most businesses to do, just as many businesses now have dedicated internal infrastructure which deals with issues such as bribery, human rights impacts, and corporate social responsibility. So finally, where do we go from here for businesses? It's sometimes thought that regulation and innovation are opposed, but actually that is a false dichotomy, as Paul was saying. Good regulation, provides a stable framework which can be extremely positive for businesses by allowing them to plan and avoid uncertainty. So what do we need? I think we're at a stage where certainly as regards explainability, which is not the only aspect of AI ethics, but it is an important one. We now have some really helpful guidance to flesh out the bare bones of the law. But businesses are unlikely to take this seriously unless and until we see some proper enforcement action. With the GDPR, the ICO's notices of, of intention to fine British Airways and Marriott hotels several hundred million pounds each sent shockwaves through industry. Obviously, regulators need to think very carefully before launching enforcement, but I think now we are at the stage where this would help businesses as a whole by providing some real-life guidance on the application of rules. That concludes my remarks, and I'm very happy to hand back to Lord Clement Jones. Jacob, thank you very much. Um, it's very interesting. You obviously um, put your remarks in sort of three categories, but in terms of the second category, AI specific uh, regulation, um, and you know, you you touched on the uh, EU white paper and so on. Um, what you didn't really touch on is the uh, any prospect of a UK. Um, a specific set of regulations surrounding forms of AI it might be live facial recognition, it might be algorithmic decision making, or whatever. I mean, do you really, do you actually believe, therefore, that everything has to be, we have to look to EU for 
uh, guidance, basically, mm -hmm. and then adapt, mm -hmm. um, at just as we've done with GDPR and so on. Do you think it's pretty futile to have, uh, uh, if you like, a, a specific UK um, set of regulations, whatever that may be? In terms of AI? Mm -hmm. I think we've got, uh, we probably need to mute somewhere. I do think at, at this stage, it would be very difficult for the UK to forge its own path in terms of setting out a different regulatory approach from that which is being adopted by the EU. Notwithstanding the uncertainty of the level of uh, continued adherence to EU regulations across all areas, and, and this is likely to be something which will form part of negotiations, perhaps it's already been dealt with, we simply don't know at the moment, with regards to Brexit. Certainly it was the government's intention, I believe it still is, to continue to adhere to the GDPR, not least because the EU um, makes it difficult to transfer data to third countries which do not have functional equivalents. So we've seen the issues that the US has had with this in the two Schrems decisions where the transfer of uh, data to the US, which is really fundamental to the way that many businesses work, uh, that has been challenged by the fact that the US might have slightly different standards for assessing the risk to national security from data. And so if the, if the UK were to have drastically different regulations from the EU, that could present a, a barrier to, to, to UK trade. So I think certainly at the moment, sticking with the, uh, the, the EU approach is um, the better way for the UK to deal with it. That said, showing leadership and working in partnership with the EU is certainly something which can still be done. And so good ideas for regulation may well still come from the, uh, the UK. We don't need to, to always be a rule taker. We can be a rule maker, even if it's in the uh, context of splitting from the EU in many other areas. I'm not quite sure whether you're being diplomatic or not, Jacob, um, but thank you. Um, uh, uh, just due warning, Paul, there is quite a, a demand for um, you to um, maybe give the five or six ground rules that you talked about earlier. So I might ask you to unpack those a little bit later on. And so we're over to Claudia, um, uh, who no doubt has been listening with considerable interest into how all this potentially, and probably already has, affected the healthcare sector. Claudia. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I should say I'm not a, a lawyer, um, for, uh, which might be uh, obvious, but uh, I do, uh, I lead a global e-health group at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm also um, a chair of a, a new digital ethics expert group for the Scottish Government. Um, and I teach ethics and governance of, of different types of technology in e-health, but other in data science more generally. Um, so I obviously flirt a lot with regulation and, and the law and so forth, uh, as well as the broader ethical issues uh, surrounding it. And some of that's uh, outside of healthcare, not just in healthcare. Um, and uh, so these are uh, you know, appealing issues on a, on a generic level too. And I, I think probably just reflecting, I've created a set piece for you. But some of those themes that have come up, I, I think are, are, are worth, I'm picking to some extent, firstly, um, this issue of technology and particularly platforms being global now and quite hard to pin down, it, you know, is, 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 you know, why haven't we got to grips with that? We've been talking about it for 10 years as these things have uh, grown up, uh, ballooned, metastasized into all sorts of other things as the platform companies have, uh, as you say, become all, all things to all people because they acquire other companies, they diversify. They become so uh, agile and slippery that it's very, very hard to, uh, to get them in your grasp. Um, and so what, what, what have we got to do then? It's clearly, we, we, we've talked to, uh, one of you is talking about uh, culture. So culture is, uh, is an issue there. Well, of course, culture is an issue. Culture is an issue globally. In one of my uh, uh, lectures to my students, we talk about the impact of culture on, on digital ethics. Um, and clearly there are different expectations and different, um, different traditions actually of, of hierarchy and so forth. Uh, there are different legal frameworks. Some are much more uh, clear and, uh, and uh, prescriptive. Others are much more sort of loose and optional, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and not complied with. 
uh, around the world. We have uh, governments and, and systems that are used to uh, much more control and coercion. Others are much more uh, into liberty and choice and, and all of that moral stuff that you were mentioning earlier. So it's certainly there are these variations. But, um, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, a, a common question is, can we have a, a global kind of rule of law or a global regulatory framework? Well, probably we can have some principles we all share. There's nothing to stop us from doing that. Whether everyone will abide by them is the, the other question. Uh, now, you know, this issue around sort of morality, I think we, we need to look at as well. Now, uh, Christopher was talking about this book, which is really trying to pin morality into your genetics. Um, you know, as if we have this natural right from wrong, well, that's clearly true. We do sort of have a sense of right from wrong, but consider the CEOs of most companies. A sociopathy, psychopathy are very highly predictive of success in some industries. So you can't really rely on their moral compass to, to you know, uh, make the rules uh, stick in their organizations. And that cascades right down through the organizational culture there. So we, we have a, a, a problem um, too. So, I mean, my sort of view on these is we, yes, certainly we need to have more transparency. We need to have opportunities to share what's going on so that other people can call it out. Uh, we need to use the platforms to regulate the platforms by having that, uh, that transparency. We probably also need to be deploying the sorts of technologies that we're concerned about as, as tools to help overcome some of these problems. For example, AI could be used to, to assess uh, what is going on in, in uh, perhaps documentation, some of those terms and conditions you, you see in your various documents, um, some of the legal uh, uh, frameworks that, that people have, uh, uh, companies have put out, all those little secret things that are going on that perhaps not, might, might not be obvious to the naked eye, but if you have enough information, could start to reveal those patterns. Um, other sorts of technologies like crowdsourcing, for example, getting more people involved using platforms to do more due diligence, for example, trained, obviously, uh, uh, authentic uh, uh, people. Um, and also really important tools like blockchain, for, you know, to, which is kind of pretty normal in some areas, certain types of supply chain areas at the moment, it's kind of normalized. But elsewhere, it's really being underutilized as a means of, of a kind of enabling a kind of a distributed, potentially global set of, of, of requirements or tools that we could use. Um, and and they, you know, they're kind of country agnostic to some extent. And everybody gets to see what's going on. So they could all decide to be horribly immoral. And of course, some people do talk about these inner circles at the top. Uh, but typically people are, ha have some sort of red face response when they're caught out. Uh, and also people won't do business with them. So, you know, there are other things that we can use and regulations on their own are just written down. They, they, they're kind of meaningless unless they have contingencies attached to them. And it's those contingencies that, you know, they don't have to necessarily be legal. There may be business contingencies. You, you will, we will not, uh, you know, you cannot enter our market unless you do this. Um, uh, you know, and, and the, it's the money that is driving it. Uh, or there may be social contingencies. No, I will not buy your product or sign up to your platform unless you, you demonstrate to me uh, that this is the case. So, I, you know, I, these are just some things that, that occurred to me in, in what you're saying. And, you know, they are good examples of these things now being used in, in areas like uh, medical device regulation, food safety standards, uh, global tra uh, transport systems, um, you know, uh, even in uh, medical science, perhaps, you know, we have, we have issues, uh, you know, around the um, regulation of, of innovations in science. For example, who's keeping an eye on that? Could we use some of these innovations to, uh, to, to better document how decisions are made? I'd also like to come back to this point about impenetrable AI. And, and we do hear a lot about deep learning and uh, you know, all this neural network learning. It's all you know, uh, you know, AlphaGo and yes, you don't know what's going on in the machine. And that is a problem. We certainly uh, have an issue in unpicking them. But 
frankly, in most of the applications we have, they are not using that sophisticated AI. There's no reason why they should be impenetrable or not explainable. And, and we're kind of being, you know, kind of cajoled into thinking that it's this kind of secret world and therefore, you know, organizations probably don't have to account for themselves quite so much because, hey, we don't really understand any more than the next guy. But actually, they can and, and they have a duty to. Great stuff. Claudia, thank you very much. Um, I mean, you obviously, in a sense, you put the uh, slightly opposing case to having over-regulation um, in that sense. Um, and you've sort of posited other forms of ensuring compliance and so on. But aren't there uh, certain aspects of the use of new technology, putting it that broadly, uh, particularly AI, where it is so high risk that you really need to start thinking um, about uh, hard regulation, if you like? Absolutely. I think we can't do without hard regulation. I was just really trying to say that there's this other layer on top. Yes. Uh, you know, it can only do, do so much. And, and I, you know, I agree that there are, you know, there's a risk stratification is, uh, in, involved there. There are some sectors which are particularly risky, either because they, they deal with very sensitive information or because they are, uh, you know, li life critical, like uh, uh, medicine or, uh, you know, uh, airline flights, for example. They, uh, you, people could die. So that you might want to perhaps prioritize those. And, and I think also, we also probably need to break it down by the types of AI and the applications of those AI. For example, if you're just doing automation, and some of that, you know, as I said, is not that rocket science, it's, it's an application. We've been doing AI for the last 30 years, for goodness sake. A lot of rebranding is going on at the moment, and, and it's not that helpful. But if we look at basic automation that, that uh, you know, just taking the human out of the loop to, to check through some medical images, for example, that's not terribly controversial. It should be judged by its evidence of whether it's effective. But when it gets into judging human beings or the qualities of human beings, it gets a lot more creepy and, uh, and in, you know, in need of much more sophisticated forms of regulation. So going back to that issue of the, uh, the genetics of morality, uh, some of the other work that I've been doing is around people analytics and the way in which is drawing on my background in psychology and doing some work in business informatics. So how are, we, how are organizations sort of quantifying and ranking and rating people for their employment prospects or their career choices? It's the same with companies rating customers. Are they then going to suddenly start to look for their genetics and rate them on their morality? And do you get promoted to the, to the board if you're, if you're not very moral and you get stuck in the lower layers if you are? What, what, how's that going to be used? I, I would sort of really be concerned about that. And I'm going to look at that book that you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I will get Chris to comment on that further, I think. But first of all, I want to bring in Paul again. Um, thanks very much, Claudia. I want to bring in Paul again, because what I want to do is also get others to respond to whether um, Paul's agenda, if you like, is where they would go at this particular moment. Paul, do you want to talk about your sort of assessment framework and the five or six sort of key elements that you mentioned earlier? Uh, you're muted. You're muted. Yes. Thank you, Tim. I'm happy to do this. Um, on the basis of the work of the High Level Group on Ethics, the Commission, in its uh, communication of 19 February uh, on AI, um, uh, the one which we are now talking about, set out a number of elements um, to look at. And uh, the risk stratification issue is one. This comes down to the fact that probably in the future, um, those to uh, produce AI or use it in the market, they must do some kind of impact assessment to understand what risks they are creating uh, with intended and maybe also with unintended use. Uh, you know, I mean, Facebook is a very good example of how a harmless uh, social networks with unintended use can turn into something uh, quite devilish. And um, so this will be uh, um, one of the issues that I think we need a new culture of risk, uh, uh, technology risk assessment uh, by the producers. And this risk assessment must look at training data. What uh, data are we using? Where is it coming from? Is it, there must be uh, duties of um, documentation, you know, 
risk assessment must be documented, the data must be documented, the program itself must be documented, and record keeping, you know, we got to keep records as a good businessman, uh, you know, I mean, uh, every architect, every car builder, every technology builder must keep the plans, and in the same way, if you do a program, you must document it for later checking. Then the question is how much information to provide about the program and their GDPR is a starting point. Uh, how far does one go beyond GDPR when there is no personal data involved? Uh, also, the processing through AI of non-personal data can have huge impacts on society or individuals. I think this will be an issue which must be addressed. Then um, there is the issue of uh, the AI doing what it is intended to do, namely robustness and accuracy, can we rely on this um, uh, program to really perform correctly? Um, you know, this is an issue in all technologies. You mentioned aviation, you mentioned uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, atomic energy, and so on, robustness and accuracy of uh, understand uh, the technology, what it is intended to do is, is very, very important. The more powerful a technology gets, Human oversight must be secured. Uh, we don't ever want to arrive uh, at the point uh, that you know, AI is our last invention, as Nick Bostrom said, and then takes over. Um, and there will be specific other requirements for certain types of AI applications. Um, these um, are going to be determined by the needs of the sector. So whenever AI is built into a device, or a service which in itself is already highly regulated, then of course the AI has to comply with all the rules of the sector. And uh, uh, maybe there will be some, um, let's say, other more specific rules. I mean, I call them to make it simple. First, the rule that people must always know that they're dealing with AI rather than a human being. People should not be misled about who their communication partner is. And second, those who develop AI and put it on the market, they must make sure that the following principle is observed, namely, AI can never do anything which would be forbidden for a human being to do. So I think you know, if you have these two last rules uh, just in mind, and then also keep in mind that you should be taking responsibility for technology, do an impact assessment, I think you are thinking in the right direction and uh, at, as, at, uh, as a general rule, as a general framework for AI, I don't think we need much more than that. Great. Thank you, Paul. Chris, do you think that's going along the right lines or would you have a more behavioral approach, um, which you just uh, described earlier? And you might want to talk just to respond to Claudia on the um, genetics of morality point. Yes, thank you. Um, I very broadly agree with the, um, all of the points that Paul's just made. It seems to me that those are the right questions and those are the points that, that the evidence needs to deal with and the expectations. Um, and incidentally, I, I think rather a good summary is in the Hazard Lords Committee, uh, sorry, the UK Government Committee on Standards in Public Life, um, which has a very similar approach to Paul's um, principles as just set out or rules. What I am challenging uh, are actually two changes, um, but I believe are, are going on at the moment. And if you've not come across these before, they will sound very strange and very familiar, and people will say, this couldn't possibly be right. Um, and there's also a tendency to blame the messenger rather than listen to the message. But I believe that actually a number of paradigms are changing here, in particular, the regulatory paradigm about how we do regulation and how we affect behavior and also actually the corporate paradigm um, about how companies behave and what their objectives are and those points th these are very big subjects and would take much longer to talk about than we have time for now but the second point i think responds mostly to um to claudia's point so let me just make a, make a few points very quickly I'm not saying no regulation, I'm saying what sort of regulation, and therefore one asks the questions I asked and the questions Paul asks. And one can see a hierarchy of encouraging uh, self-regulation, as Jacob said, and the more self-regulation that works and is trustworthy, the less um, the, the official system has to do. Now, traditionally speaking, um, 
companies have been uh, motivated by money because we have the model of maximizing shareholder value. There was a large statement about that on the front of The Economist last October, which came from the US Business Roundtable. And it's very controversial, but it basically says that Milton Friedman was wrong and we no longer maximize uh, shareholder value. We should be maximizing stakeholder value. In other words, companies need to rethink what they're doing and think about their purposes and um, their organizations, which includes the corporate governance elements, but how they run things and, and how much money are they paying people, how they're incentivizing people, how they judge people, etc. Now, what you see if you start talking to business school um, experts and within companies is there's been an enormous amount of change. So it's very easy to come out with horror stories which of what have been um, Fred the Shred, since we're talking about um, Edinburgh, comes to my mind. Um, and there are plenty of other horror stories of individuals who are, um, and, and sit operating within systems, who are motivated by um, wanting to can dominate and control everything and um, maximizing shareholder value, in other words, just profits. I know a lot of organizations who don't run themselves that way. and we've mentioned one book there are a lot of other books on this there's a very interesting one by bruno roche called completing capitalism which um uh, looks at things that mars inc have been doing for example but plenty of other examples that organizations are changing how they do things so we need to encourage that now if one goes back to the old-fashioned paradigm therefore on the regulatory side about assuming that deterrence works of course, large fines capture the attention of the board, but there's the well-known phrase, it's a cost of business. They might change a few things, but do they really operate on the basis of doing things that they should be doing? Are they effective? Now, um, the GDPR, um, of course, sent shockwaves through the industry and it gets the attention of boards, but does it actually promote the detail of doing the right thing? Does he actually promote changes in behavior in the way we would want it, want it to? Um, is it actually demotivating for companies who think that they're trying to do the right thing or people inside companies who think, is it resented? I, I've come across many examples talking to people on the ground who say they, they now treat regulators, especially by the way, competition regulators, as um, with whom they don't have a relationship, whereas they, they usually have a relationship with other regulators. They don't treat them as their friends, they treat them as the enemy. That means they don't collaborate, they don't coordinate, they don't talk to people, they don't improve the system. This is happening, for example, at the moment in Australia, where there were lots of problems, um, there was wrongdoing, but the whole system was driven by money. So a Royal Commission uh, headed by a judge, says the answer is deterrence, much more litigation, send the bankers to jail, frighten them. It's led to a complete implosion and loss of confidence in the economic system, which at the moment is that maybe that's a bit, <laughs> bit high. But anyway, the, the point is also deterrence has been practiced in the USA, Paul mentioned the USA, in public enforcement and private enforcement, large fines, large damages for decades. So why is it necessary to continue? You'd have thought it might have worked by now. But actually, the problem is the, the way capitalism is done and business is done, which is, I think, changing, and the, therefore the way regulation is done, which needs to change as well, and to be based on much more understanding. A simple constitutional point, deterrence rules by fear. Is that constitutionally acceptable? Because what I would say is that the European Commission, for example, is currently intending to rule a lot of companies by fear. And I have worries about that, about how um, the, the effects of that are okay. done. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to um, come to uh, Jacob in a minute because I'm going to ask you about where we might need um, uh, 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 new regulation um, and also um, uh, a, a couple of other um, questions, Jacob. But um, Claudia, um, an emphasis that uh, Paul made was on the kind of human-centered aspect. And of course, that is very much 
uh, uh, very much part of, if you like, the EU approach to AI. I mean, you're an ethicist. How important is that? Or do you think um, that is a little bit of a distraction in the face of, of new technology? I mean, after all, we don't always insist on that in other forms of new technology. Well, I think the human is, is important because the humans are who are creating this, who are uh, making decisions about how to use it, uh, how not to use it, uh, deciding whether to comply with regulation or whether to use, uh, you know, fancy footwork to get around it. And remember, you know, in the American model, you know, regulation and law is, is really just your, your kind of the template that you have to work around. So you kind of have to work around what, what you can get off with. Um, so that's, uh, you know, the, the people, but critically, and I, I am pleased to hear uh, Christopher say this, and I, I think certainly coronavirus may be having this effect, as I believe one of your uh, papers, I can't remember which one, uh, mentioned it, which, which I agree with, is, is perhaps shifting the emphasis onto this, uh, these other sorts of responsibilities. And one um, thing I, you know, is particularly important is the value of integrity, uh, the value of morality, the value of ethics, the value of not having to be told to wash your hands, because you know, that's a bad analogy, but um, not having to be told to do it, doing it because you, you want to. And, and I came across quite an interesting book recently, uh, or a book title, I didn't have a time to dig into it, called Return on Integrity. Of a kind of new form of capital, and and I would agree with that. And I've been saying so, uh, you know, for, for for many years, speaking to companies, if they if they if they want to, you know, ethics is about the bottom line. Uh, you know, compliance regulation is just it's just the hurdle. It's just the way it's written down. It, it's about you know, if you if you do good, look how Apple has succeeded over some other companies, for example, and and uh, because it tried to demonstrate evidence, if you like, it's um, it's integrity um, and uh, and other companies are doing that before uh, just now Jacob has mentioned uh, a lot of virtue signal going on in companies and I, I say that it's quite a pejorative term but often it is quite it's virtue signaling it's it's like saying you know hey you know we you can trust us we're the good guys and we're doing the best we can and some of that may be good that may be filtering down we're seeing mark zuckerberg saying some some fairly good things actually about what they're trying to do and of course they get hammered every time they try and do something good obviously doing quite a lot of evil stuff uh, as well but you know there's a, a quite a lot of tokenistic ethics going on as well and uh, and uh, people use the phrase ethics washing to talk about these panels that are set up with all the people that you know are going to say the things that you want them to say um, and sometimes they're much more independent and, and self-critical and, and so on but it's not a done deal uh, but I would just say that's probably you know in, in general uh, the people are the people are important because the people are the weak points and the people are the points of strength and and regulations are just tools that you can you can use well or otherwise Great, thank you very much. I can see we're going to have to exchange reading lists uh, yes. at the end of this. Fantastic. Uh, Jacob, um, just, um, uh, I mean, obviously you touched on this to some extent, but I mean, the question has been asked, where do you see um, the gaps, so to speak? I mean, in particular, I mean, one of our questioners at the very outset, um, before even we started today's session, talked about, you know, the greater availability of personal information, um, the leakage of personal information. I mean, do we actually need changes to GDPR, for instance, to take account of artificial intelligence and the use of, of huge data sets for training, the question of uh, you know, decisions which might um, uh, be based on biased data and so on. Um, do, you, do you see the need uh, in sort of your daily practice, so to speak, for new regulation? And I think the second point I'd make is, when we're um, going for new regulation, do you perceive yet um, whether or not there's a bit of a squeeze where we, we're going to have to make it, we've got a binary choice between following EU rules or the US approach, which is rather different? I think there are two main areas where new regulation would be useful for businesses, or if not uh, regulation, perhaps uh, a, a degree of guidance. The first, uh, we haven't really touched on this uh, so far, is 
the responsibility for artificial intelligence. If AI goes wrong, who is held responsible? The, the flip side of this, um, which I don't propose to talk about, is where AI creates something beneficial, who is the owner, the intellectual property aspect? And they're really two sides of the same coin. We do, of course, have lots of existing rules and regulations on who's responsible for harm, but AI, I, don't, I, I think, does challenge certain of these concepts, which essentially try to link everything back to a meaningful human decision, where you have, to some degree, an autonomous decision made by an AI system. It can be difficult to fit the existing rules to the way that that technology works. Now, that's not to say that the, the, the courts would simply throw, throw their hands in the air and say, we don't know what to do. The problem for businesses, however, is that there is uncertainty, and uncertainty can be costly. Uncertainty can lead to people uh, taking a defensive approach and perhaps not um, releasing into the market certain technologies because they don't know what the legal consequences are going to be. So some further guidance on responsibility, I think, would be useful. And that could include um, setting up a, a system of requirements when AI is being developed, as, as has been being discussed in order to make sure there is a record of who is responsible at each, at each stage of AI development so that one can then go back and look and see, and, and see where the problem uh, arose um, in, in the different stages so far as possible. The second area where I think greater guidance is needed is in terms of ethics. We have, to some extent, as I've already mentioned, guidance on explainability of AI, but there are many other areas of ethics, which broadly speaking break down into two parts. Firstly, how should AI take difficult decisions? What parameters should they adhere to? We have some written rules for the way that humans take difficult decisions. We have some unwritten rules for the way that humans take difficult decisions. And we are now, particularly with coronavirus, having to grapple with very difficult ethical trade-offs. Who gets the ventilator first? Do you prioritise opening up the economy over uh, protecting the maximum number of lives? And these are the kinds of difficult uh, decisions which perhaps not quite as big, but if we are going to, to delegate certain decisions to AI, we need to think about what constraints will be placed and what guidance will be given to those who are setting up the AI systems. The final issue of ethics is whether there are any decisions which AI should never take. And these include, for example, the use of AI in making life or death medical decisions, in policing, facial recognition technologies in certain contexts. And as we've discussed already, some companies are taking matters into their own hands and saying, well, this is too risky, we, it will look too bad, we just don't want our technology to be involved in this. But I think in the long term, that type of self-restraint approach is not sustainable because what you may well have is scrupulous companies excluding themselves from these areas of the market, but unscrupulous companies um, simply filling the void and taking their place. And so what you have is the worst of all worlds, where you have a lack of regulation, uh, uh, both from regulators and a lack of self-regulation from the companies themselves. So I, I think those are really the, the, the main areas where we can do with um, uh, some more regulation over the over the coming years. If, if I could very briefly um, just respond to a couple of points that were raised by uh, other speakers. Um, I, I liked Paul's um, five, uh, five or, so, or so principles. The, the final one on the, that AI must never do anything that would be forbidden for a human being, I think perhaps could do with some nuance. There are certain rules which um, cater to the limitations of humans, to human frailties, which AI may not have. So for example, in the UK, it's limited to drive at 70 miles an hour on a motorway. But let's say a self-driving car was much more effective than a, a human. I mean, we don't have this yet, but if we get to a stage where self-driving cars can drive at 100 miles an hour very safely, at 150 miles an hour very safely, why would we then limit that? to what humans can do. We, we'd be negating the benefits of the AI, just as when cars were first invented in the 19th century. In, in, in Britain, we had rules that somebody must walk in front of those cars waving a red flag, which basically negated the whole purpose of having a car, because it could only go at, at walking speed. Um, the, the second thing which um, I'd just like to mention is that I very much agree with Claudia's point about the value of doing things because you want to do. I think we need to get away from a debate about either regulation or no regulation. 
there are many different ways of ensuring compliance. And I think we need to, to think about, as well as having regulation and deterrence, the uh, mechanisms for instilling a culture of compliance um, amongst both the general population and particularly those who are developing AI. One idea for this is to have a form of ethical training which is mandatory for all AI engineers, a form of a Hippocratic oath, in the same way that doctors, lawyers, architects, airline pilots must all go through certain types of mandatory training before they're qualified to practice. Great stuff. Thank you, Jacob. Now, I'm going to ask each of our panel very unfairly in one or two sentences, but please no more than that. What is top of your wish list? And this can be either at national or international level, and it can be in terms of non-regulation or regulation. So over to you, and I'm going to start with Chris. Um, Recognise that the traditional approaches to what drives human behavior in organizations and therefore in regulation are actually undergoing a complete revolution at the moment. So do not assume that previous approaches, previous systems work. <coughs> of course, we need a lot of the same Thank rules you. and all the rest of it. You're over your sentence. How we do it is important. Perfect. Thank you. Paul. Let democracy play its role and help it doing so rather than making democratic decision difficult. Brilliant. Uh, 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 Claudia? Um, having conversations about the use of AI in government, by government, for government. Excellent. Jacob? Continue the trend of the move from high level principles on AI towards detailed guidance for individuals and businesses. Well, look, um, we've had a most uh, uh, fantastic uh, conversation. I must say we've unpacked an enormous amount. And I think that um, we've got a recording, I think, haven't we, uh, Irena, as well. Um, and uh, there are probably a number of questions that we haven't managed to really get into. But nevertheless, I hope um, attendees will feel that we've uh, uh, dealt with quite a number of them in different ways. Um, but it's really been a great conversation, this. And really, it's a start. I mean, in a way, uh, the wish list that everybody had at the end demonstrates that we're really still in the foothills in many ways. And, you know, we've got to keep moving uh, to really encompass what needs to be done. Um, uh, uh, and it may be that we go for soft regulation rather than, you know, the full blown um, effort. But nevertheless, we've got to get some uh, consensus on that as to where it's appropriate, where it's not appropriate. And I think today has been very helpful in, in doing that. And I hesitate um, to say that I am not going to do a summary of, uh, of what our splendid panel have, uh, have said today. Um, uh, you can consider that for yourself. Um, uh, when you get the recording or the uh, report of the proceedings. Um, I'm now going to turn over to Irena, but I'm going to thank our panel very, very much indeed. I can hear all the virtual applause um, uh, for contributions, and I very much hope that you'll return um, before too long to another BIICL uh, uh, conversation. Thank you very much indeed. And over to you, Irena. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, and uh, from, uh, from Bicol. Um, again, many thanks to, to Chris, Paul, Jacob, and uh, uh, Claudia for this uh, brilliant conversation, and Tim, of course, for, uh, for leading it and the uh, perfect timekeeping as well. Uh, many thanks to, to you, uh, of course, in the audience for, uh, for participating and for, um, for your questions. Uh, the webinar, as he mentioned, has been uh, recorded and the video, um, as well as uh, previous video recording of our webinars in the series um, and, in, and links to, to the material that have been mentioned today will uh, be available on the um, BICOL website shortly. Um, and just uh, um, we will, we will also produce a summary, a summary report of this, uh, of this webinars. Um, back to, to you, Tim, maybe just for a few con concluding words on, uh, on Bicol. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. And I think that um, you've got a slide there that you're going to put up, aren't you, Irena? That's brilliant. Um, and so, as you know, this was the third webinar. If you enjoyed today's webinar, do consider making a donation to support BIICL. Um, it's a very uncertain time for everybody. 
um, uh, BIICL relies on donations, event income, and research grants to deliver its activities. So please, um, if you enjoyed today or any previous uh, uh, one of the conversations, do uh, 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 go to the website and uh, show your appreciation. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much to everybody at BIICL. And once again, thank you to our terrific panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>